All right, okay, I know how to use this. I'm sort of talking to the sun now. <coughs> so we're going to try and see if we can get you in then. Come on. Come on then, let's go. If you like to have badge to enter inside, we can do for you library badge. Visitor badge. Library card to enter to inside. To use the library we inside. See. We will see. We will Dajui, do everything we can do. We can do. Similar this badge for here to enter also. Yeah. You came to listen if you like. Yeah, sure. We'll try and get her a badge. Okay. Well, well, you guys try then, okay? Because I've got no pull at this place. No, no. I no, no, we go together Hassan now. told me, Naji, that he will work about this. Therefore, we will go now inside. I see, okay. See, Naji, what he can do. It's not, not a big deal. If you don't have another uh, plane to go inside uh, Geneva to take tour or to do something. No, I have to be here. I came for this. Okay, good. I came a long way from the other side of the world. <laughs> I'm professional radiation specialist for three oh. years. Huh? In both of Through the machine, so it goes, but it switch it off. Right? Yeah, don't switch off. You have to switch it off, so it goes through the machine. You can Can't put take it, it through in the there. machine. Well, not well, it's running. Yeah. Why not? And I'm the uh, legal expert of International Educational Development Association of Humanitarian Lawyers. And I am very pleased that our association has co sponsored this event. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. We've been waiting for a few people who had indicated Karen Parker. they would be here. Uh, but I think we'll begin uh, begin now. We have a, an extraordinarily interesting uh, pair of people to present information to you, and I want to have some chance for some response and then some impassioned plea type uh, discussions. I got involved in depleted uranium from various sources, including from the wife of the former president of Greece. Margarita Papandreou. We presented the statistics, the information, the tragedy of what was going on in at the first Gulf War in 1996 here in Geneva. And I'm pleased that that very year the United Nations Subcommission agreed to, agreed with our assessment that depleted uranium weaponry was already illegal and therefore didn't need a specific treaty ban and initiated a procedure to in a sense flesh out why depleted uranium and some of the other bad weapons then on the table and in use were by law operation of humanitarian or armed conflict law the law of weaponry already illegal <coughs> with some maneuvering, particularly from my government, I'm from the United States, that tried to derail that initiative, we finally did manage to get a rapporteur nominated from the United Nations Subcommission who wrote reports uh, as intended on these issues. In a sense, what I had set out to show was already accomplished in that the independent experts on these issues from around the world had said, had decided, had decreed vis-a-vis -vis resolutions, reports, etc., that these weapons are already illegal. Therefore, the question became what to do about the fact that countries, in particular one, are using weapons with depleted uranium. The discussions at the United Nations Forum, as is on this floor here, were very alarming to some of the countries that had, in fact, purchased depleted uranium weapons or had them foisted upon them by the United States. So at present, we have both India and Pakistan, already a tinderbox, with depleted uranium weapons. We know Russia has them. We know China has them. We know Israel has them. And several other countries have them. But with some exceptions, there does not appear that any of the other countries 
that had these weapons have used them after we had discussions and uh, testimony on the floor uh, as is upstairs uh, about the effect of depleted uranium. When the United States military forces attacked the hospital in Fallujah in 2004, uh, I was furious because hospitals, regardless of what weapons you used, hospitals are off limits. You cannot attack a hospital. I brought an action at the Organization of American States against the United States on that issue. Uh, they uh, had it under review. And then because the Bush administration was thumbing its nose at that forum, I did not want that case to be a case which showed to the rest of the hemisphere where the OAS sits that none of the other countries need to comply because the big superpower in the area is not. Uh, there were several issues that I in fact won at the OAS on this case and on an earlier case, which is that a country can be liable for violations of human rights outside, that it, that it that it engages in outside its own borders. This is a very, very important victory. But I basically told the Organization of American States to put on hold the rest of the Fallujah case because I was afraid that the United States would flaunt its non-compliance with anything the OAS said. And in effect, the damage was done and I was looking for different kinds of remedies uh, that maybe could have an effect, and in particular, continuing to alert the international community. The people, uh, I was going to say on both sides of me, uh, the people on my left are people who have done phenomenal work, both in the scientific aspects of depleted uranium and in the day-to-day -day results of depleted uranium use on, on civilians and people. So I will, without further ado, introduce them. Uh, we will begin with Dr. Chris, Christopher Ives. Chris, Christopher uh, Busby, who's on my far left. He's visiting professor at the University of Ulster. He's scientific director of the Cancer and Birth Defect Foundation in the UK. And if there's anyone in the Western world that has done more on the science of uranium and depleted uranium, I don't know them. So <laughs> you are... Uh, very honored to have for you today, Dr. Busby. Press something. Yes, hello. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a study that we did in Fallujah. I have been involved in the study of depleted uranium probably since 1996, uh, and I visited Iraq in 2000 and Kosovo in 2001 and measured this, uh, measured this material in the field. Um, and also I've done a considerable amount of research on the health effects and, and the mechanism of the health effects. Now this Fallujah study, which I'm going to talk about today, um, was published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. The reason that we undertook this study was that there was a lot of information coming out of Iraq, uh, and has been since about 2000, <coughs> of increases in birth defects and cancer in populations in Iraq. In fact, that's why I went to Iraq in 2000 with Al Jazeera to, to visit the hospitals and to make measurements and to see for myself what I thought the situation was. Now, despite all of this evidence coming out of Iraq from ordinary people and from doctors, um, there has been no systematic scientific study of the situation. And I was asked uh, by Malak Hamden, if there was a way in which we could investigate this scientifically, and I said, of course there is. And uh, we, we, we went and, and looked at the people of Fallujah, because that was an area where these problems seemed to be um, uh, appearing at the highest level. Uh, so we did this study in Fallujah this last year. This is what we did. We organized a team of interviewers uh, to visit about 700 homes, random homes, in the town uh, between January and February 2010. And uh, we asked uh, simple questions um, to get the base population of the people living in that area. There were about 4,850 people living at the addresses. 
Um, and we got their names and their identification numbers, and also the numbers and types of cancer reported in the previous five years, back to 2004, the number of infant deaths, and we also got the number of miscarriages and uh, a number of other diseases and so on, which we didn't include in the initial report, and we may do another report when we've gone back and analyzed more of this. But the important thing was to see if the reports of increases in cancer and infant mortality were, were based on fact. Uh, so we compared the sex and age specific cancer rates in the study group of 4,800 people over that period of time to the rates in Egypt and also the rates in Jordan. So we're using those as a baseline in order to see whether there were any increases in, in these people in, in this group, this study group in Fallujah. Now in the five year period to 2010, we did find an enormously high level of cancer, an absolutely extraordinarily high level of cancer. And it's, I've never seen anything like this in any of the studies I've ever done. And I'll tell you what we found. First of all, there were 62 cases of cancer in this group of 4,800 people. And you have to remember that cancer is basically a disease of old age. So although there are 4,800 people, most of these people are young people. And in six, 62 cases gave us a relative risk, that is, that there were about four times the, the total number of cancer cases than there would have been if this had been the Egyptian or the Jordanian group, uh, um, rates. But this included 16 cases of childhood cancer, age 0 to 14, which gave us a relative risk of 12.6. These are all highly significant. That CI means the confidence inter interval. So we know that the, that the real number is between about 5 and 32. <coughs> so there's 12 times of childhood cancer there. Now, you, have, you know, the, the, this is an enormously high level of childhood cancer. Uh, in the UK, there was a public inquiry when it turned out that there was a childhood cancer rate of just nine times near the nuclear reprocessing plant in Sellafield. And the highest risks we found were in leukemias. And in the age group 0 to 34, we found 38 times the expected number. This is astonishing. 38 times the expected number of leukemias. This is higher than anything that has been seen in, the, I think, probably the whole of the history of epidemiology. The highest rates of leukemia um, so far were found in the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings. And those levels were about maybe 17, 20 times the expected number. And here we've got almost 40 times the expected number. And we also found high levels of lymphoma, breast cancer. You can see there that there's a relative risk of about 10 for breast cancer. So 10 times the breast cancers you'd expect if the population was based on the Egyptian rates, and also brain tumors. And then we looked at infant deaths. And when we looked at infant deaths, we found 34 deaths in this age group over the period. And that gives a rate of 80 per 1,000 births. Uh, and this, and in, in the West here, probably in Switzerland, I doubt if the rates of infant mortality are greater than about 6 per 1,000 births. So we've got 80 here, and in Egypt there was 19.8. So it's about four times the, the, child, the, the infant mortality rates than, than they find in Egypt. And of course it's much lower in Kuwait too, where they have a much better um, health system. But it's getting worse. So in the most recent few months, this rate increased to 130 per thousand births. So that whatever's happening there, it's getting worse. Then most important, we found the sex ratio. Now the sex ratio is the number of boys born to, the, to, to a thousand girls. And this is normally in human populations all over the world. In a, in a human population where people are not exposed to any genetic damage, you always get a rate of about 1,050 boys to every thousand girls. But what we found here was 860 uh, boys were born to 1,000 girls in the population born just after 2004. Now, the interesting thing here is that before 2004, the sex ratio was normal, or approximately normal. So whatever it was that happened that caused this high level of cancer, high level of infant mortality, and the sex ratio change, it occurred in 2004. This is the most important result that we had here. So we can say that whatever happened in 2004 caused a massive amount of genetic damage, uh, and the type of genetic damage was the same as the genetic damage uh, uh, spectrum that, that was found after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it was much worse. So how can we be sure that these results are correct? Well, firstly, we've done a lot of these studies elsewhere in the United Kingdom. I've done about studies and in at least one of these studies, the local cancer registry came along afterwards because there was a big fuss 
and they and they did their own study using official data and found that our results were, were almost exactly correct. Um, of course, when I say 38-fold increases in leukemia, I mean the, this is this is a number, and it may be uncertain. There may be a certain amount of uncertainty in that because there are structural problems with these sorts of studies. A certain amount of uh, there are a number of problems which we discuss in the paper. Uh, and if you want to know more about 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 this, you should look at the scientific paper which is published on the internet. Um, and so if you, put, if you type in Fallujah cancer or Fallujah Busby into, the, into Google, you'll very quickly find this, this paper, which is an open access paper. You can download it as a PDF, and you can study it as much as you like. And if there's any questions you, you have, uh, my email is on the paper. You can contact me. Now, what, so what can we conclude from this study? Well, what we can conclude is that the population has been exposed to an extreme level of genetic damage. We can, con we, can, we can see that the spectrum of conditions, the particular kinds of cancer, uh, in particular the leukemias and the lymphomas, are, 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 are a signal, are a sort of a footprint for exposure to ionizing radiation. The spectrum is, is similar to the, the spectrum found in the atomic bomb survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the trend in sex ratio changes, as I've, all, as I've just said, um, points to an event in 2004. And before 2004, the sex ratios were normal. So what we can conclude from this study is something terrible happened in 2004, and it was a, an event which involved an extreme level of genetic damage. So we have to look for something that caused it. So what could this be? Well, first of all, the spectrum of genetic damage conditions points, as I said, to some ionizing radiation exposure of some kind. In principle, it could also have been caused by an, a, very, a very powerful chemical mutagen like mustard gas. But, but mustard gas is, uh, is a very long-lived substance in the environment, and it would certainly still be there and easy to detect. And also, it would have left other sorts of evidence, because mustard gas causes a, a quite unmistakable um, type of damage in, in human beings. You get blistering, and you get, you get, you get uh, conditions that doctors can easily diagnose as due to mustard gas. And people have talked about the use of white phosphorus a lot. I think this is a smoke screen, if I, if I can use that pun. Uh, white, white phosphorus does not cause genetic damage. It's not a mutagen. It causes terrible burning, and it causes all sorts of conditions, but it doesn't cause genetic damage. It's not a mutagen. So what does that leave? Well, everybody says depleted uranium. <coughs> but, there, but there are some problems with, the, with this interpretation. Incidentally, we did take some samples from Fallujah. We've got some soil samples which are being analyzed, and they do show the presence of uranium. Um, but I won't say too much about that, because we're, having to do, we're doing a lot more analysis on these samples, and we're getting more samples, so we're doing more work on this. And, and, and you'll see why as I, as I go on. There are problems with the inference that, that, that this is caused by depleted uranium. And the main problem is that uh, is one that's, that's raised very often by, even by the people who are concerned about depleted uranium. There's a big argument about this because depleted uranium was first used in the 1991 Gulf War and since then has been used in Kosovo and in Bosnia uh, and various places, but primarily as an anti-tank weapon, a, 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 a weapon for destroying armor. Now, I know, because I've been there, that if you fire depleted uranium penetrators, they're called, they're, they're, like, they're like bullets, but they're just, they're just pieces of uranium, basically, like a pencil. Um, if they hit a brick wall, or, they, or, or if they hit the ground, if they don't hit armor, then they don't burn, and they, and they just are found. They just flatten out, and they're found on the ground, lying about. And the question, obvious question is, why would anyone use such a, a weapon in Fallujah when there was no armor in Fallujah? Well, one answer is they might have just wanted to do it in order to cause genetic damage. I mean, that is, you know, just out of spite, if you like, as a radiation weapon. But, but that does seem to be rather a strange interpretation. And so we have another possible interpretation, and that is that there is maybe, and I think there is evidence that which I'll present, that there is another uranium weapon that's been developed. Uh, and the reason we think this is because we have discovered the existence of not depleted uranium, but enriched uranium in a number of samples from different war zones. The first one I obtained from the Lebanon in 2006. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I found enriched uranium in samples from Gaza. 
And other, other scientists have also found enriched uranium in the Lebanon and in other places. And what I want to say to you today is that the significance of what we're finding is potentially terrifying. And it needs to be urgently, independently followed up because it affects everybody in the world, not just the people of Fallujah or the people of Iraq. Now, we should say something about this. The, the normal isotopic ratio of the two isotopes, of, the main isotopes that are used uh, um, that are, uh, in, in, in uranium, uh, U238 and 235, there is another isotope, 234, but this doesn't have to concern us. The isotopic ratio normally is 138. So if you, if you dig up uranium from the ground and you measure the ratio of 238 to 235, you'll always get 138. If it's above 140 and below 136, you get either depleted if it's above and enriched or man-made if it's below. So either of these things are man-made. If you find uranium somewhere and it's got an isotopic signature of 210, you know it's man-made. If it's got an isotopic ratio of 60, you know it comes from a nuclear power station. These are man-made signatures. Now in 2006, we found in Qiyam and in Beirut, in two different um, samples, and also, I haven't written here, but also in, in water samples, we found a, an enriched ratio of 115. And this was using two separate techniques from two separate labs. So there's absolutely no argument about this. There is enriched uranium out there. Dr. Ali Kobesi of the Lebanese Academy of Sciences took other samples, which also showed enriched uranium. And United Nations Environment Program took samples and reported no anomalies. So we don't think that the UNEP are independent in this area. I also obtained uh, enriched uranium in Gaza from, uh, with a ratio of about 120. And, as I, and, and Randy Parrish in the UK originally reported the presence of ura enriched uranium in samples that he was an analyzing, but he refused to say where they were from, from when, we were, we, when we were on the, the Ministry of Defense depleted uranium oversight board. So, so we have to ask the question, why is enriched uranium turning up in, in, in these places? Now, the reason we have to ask this is because enriched uranium is very expensive. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not cheap stuff. It takes a lot of energy to produce enriched uranium, and they use it as a fuel for nuclear power stations. And to use it in, as a weapon, it's like shooting your enemy with diamonds. So the, there are a number of questions why are we finding enriched uranium. What some people have suggested that it's a cover-up for the use of depleted uranium. Other people suggest it might be a component of a new weapon or the product of a new weapon. <coughs> and of course, there might be an explanation that nobody's thought about. Now, that, now as soon as we think about new weapon, we have to, th have to realize that since 2003, in Lebanon and in Gaza, some completely new types of injuries have been reported in casualties. Injuries that doctors who are accustomed to uh, treating um, war casualties have never seen before. Uh, the Iraqi troops in Baghdad airport, and these were Saddam Hussein's crack troops, you have to remember. And there was going to be a huge fight there, and, the, and everyone was expecting the Americans to take a, 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 lot, of, um, a, 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 a lot of casualties. Actually were reported found dead in their defensive positions without any real battle being fought. The United States also refused to allow the International Atomic Energy Agency into Iraq with radiation measuring equipment. After the, after the 2003 Gulf War, which is very strange because the Gulf War was fought, the 2003 war was fought on the idea that there, was, uh, that there were weapons of mass destruction, that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons. And you would expect the IAEA to come in there and, and check on that, but they were not allowed in for six months. And also, the Iraqis tell me, many of Ira Iraqis have told me that, that the United States um, cleared up the, the surface soil in all of the wet places where these weapons had been used and trucked it out into the desert so that nobody could come and measure anything in this soil afterwards. And in fact, other people have noticed this, and a new weapons group of scientists has been formed based in Italy and being run by Paola Manduca. So how could enriched uranium be involved in such a weapon? Okay, I, I haven't got much time. But I'm going to just quickly to say that there are a number of ways in which enriched uranium can be involved. They can make a, if you dissolve hydrogen in uranium, you can produce a thermobaric glass weapon. But there is a suggestion by a number of scientists that, that a new kind of atomic weapon has been developed involving low yield cold fusion. If you, put, if you dissolve deuterium, heavy hydrogen, into <coughs> depleted uranium powder or into enriched uranium powder, you get, a, you get a neutron bomb. 
you get a substance, you get a bomb which is small, which can be used as anti-personnel and can produce neutrons and gamma radiation. And I, so, so is this crazy? Is this like the Martians have landed? Well, it's not, because we have to explain real things. We have to explain the discovery of enriched uranium, the levels of genetic damage, the strange deaths without apparent wounds, and the lengths to which the US went to clean up the evidence, also the bloodless defeat. So maybe there is such a thing. And these fusion weapons have actually been described in theory by a number of physicists, Della Guidici in Italy, and Dr. Sponen, a, a, a Frenchman in, in, in Oxford. So if such weapons exist, then it's an imp imperative that they be discovered and banned. And we must therefore demand that the US and Israeli military give full details of such weapons. And we must try and spend, spend some time independently going to look for traces of these weapons. Because fusion weapons do leave a discoverable signature in the environment. But even if this isn't the case, we know from recent science that uranium aerosols alone have a huge and newly discoverable genetic uh, effects. And this affects everybody because this material goes all over the globe. It doesn't just stay in Iraq, it doesn't just stay in Fallujah. And recently it's been discovered that the Israelis are suffering genetic damage and that there's been a 40% reduction in their fertility, 40% reduction in sperm count uh, in, a, in a paper that was published in Jerusalem in the last few months. So, so this is a very important issue. It's an issue where the whole of the world are involved, is involved. Every single person is involved, your children and your grandchildren. We are currently destroying the genetic um, constituent of the human race. And of course, other, other animals and plants and, and all living systems on Earth. These substances are terrifying and we have to stop them being used. We have to find out where they're used and stop them being used. And I don't have any more time to talk about this, but that's my message to all of you people here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris Daraji. He is the president of Conservation Center of Environment and Reserves in Fallujah, and he is director of Monitoring Net of Human Rights in Iraq, and he has some alternative possibilities for bringing to justice for, for uh, use of weaponry that have been stymied, in a sense, purposefully at the Organization of American States. Mohammed, please. Good morning, all. Uh, I would also add it uh, to my colleague only one thing that I am also a former member of the Lucha Council uh, during the uh, the, the December 2003 and until the June 2004. Firstly, I want to, to start from uh, Fallujah uh, history. Fallujah is a small town. If you look for the map, you will find that uh, Fallujah is between uh, the size of it four to five kilometers. There is 300,000 person inhabitant inside the city. And around Fallujah, there is the three big village have also 350,000 uh, 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 350, habitants. Totally, there will be 650,000 habitants in all the Fallujah. If we look also, the, the hospital, the main hospital of Fallujah is another uh, side of the river, out the city. And uh, this is one from the point we want to show that any uh, embargo or cutting the route to this hospital will be 600 thousand person from any uh, uh, medical health. Religious history was uh, uh, known as the conservative people. And religious people, they don't accept any touch for their culture or their religions. Therefore, and during the uh, British uh, occupation in 1941, there was also a big battle in Fallujah between my people and the British against the uh, British uh, occupation uh, at this time. If we look for uh, the American policy in my city, I will give all the evidence what I thought that the international community should take look for it because all this confirmed there is uh, not only uh, collective punishment, punishment for my people, but there is strategy give it some advices or some uh, strategy give it from criminal side that they continue this until now without to let any chance for peace or real investigation or help for the peace. 
The first problem happened in Fallujah in th uh, 23 of April 2003, as we see here. The uh, American arrived after uh, Kuwait to Baghdad. They arrived to Fallujah without any fighting. They asked the Fallujah that to remove anything related with the former uh, uh, government. They don't get anything from anything, but after they decide don't came first time uh, uh, with the agreement of Fallujah, after two days, they enter and they evacuated some schools to be military bases. The students go and, uh, for this school, go on the demonstration, peaceful demonstration, to ask Americans to go out from the school and also to stop looking by uh, anything inside the houses of the civilian with the conservative culture for the people don't accept like this. In the first demonstration, Americans opened the fire, and as we see here, they killed many civilians and also they wounded many of them. After uh, two days, the people to take the, this body to the cemetery in Fonira, they also American open uh, in this criminal uh, killing for this uh, the peaceful demonstration. And they killed another civilian and wounded uh, also some hundred, with also there is some children inside this. This policy generated not only resistance, try to we look as activists of human rights. Violence made violence. Another crime is happening. Second crime it will be, it was the uh, Fallujah people created with the mayor of Fallujah, a new forces to help the police in Fallujah. It was the, call it uh, Fallujah Protection Force. These people from the former <coughs> military army, but the professional people, they help to prevent any looting, prevent any accident, any uh, crimes inside to help the police with the situation after the occupation starts. In, uh, uh, in the night, in the middle of night of 11 of uh, September uh, 2003, there is unknown car, Bianco, came at night to shooting on the building of the mire. The Fallujah Protection Forces following this Bianco car until the road uh, to go to Baghdad, and uh, they see this car go inside the military base, and without to do anything, they try to return to Fallujah. If we see the, the green uh, uh, hospital, Jordanian hospital beside Fallujah, in front of it, it was there is uh, uh, American military uh, checkpoint. They, they opened the fire on the uh, Fallujah police with Fallujah protection forces, and the fire concentrate on the well and the car of the Fallujah protection forces. And they killed more than seven, as we see the, the name of them, and also wounded most of them, prevent any ambulance, anyone to came to help them from <coughs> the 3 a.m. at night until the 6 a.m. in morning, because they thought they are died, until one of them, it was escaping under the car, and after the uh, sun rise, there was many people beside the accident, and the American cannot do anything, only to give them data to show these crimes. Another one about arbitrary detention and torching, and the rule of black water. It was it's like systematic uh, daily uh, uh, crimes and violation happened against my people or the civilian. I show this story exactly because this is for my uh, uh, one from my neighbors behind my home. These guys, the American uh, uh, troops came at night, in this date, uh, 18 of June 2006, and asking this boy to show the identity card which Americans do for Fallujah people after the Second War. And when they know him exactly, they start shooting at him and kill him. After they take his uh, brother, the young, uh, 13 years, I mean, and they torching him, but the person torching him, he was also uh, have barber with some rings, is not from the American military, which give us evidence this is also maybe from the Blackwater uh, clientes. We won't came for the first uh, uh, battle or assault on Fallujah. All of us, we remember the killing of the four count, uh, contractors uh, security. I was with these people in, uh, when, from the meeting when I was a member in the local council of Fallujah. One of the meetings, the, the clients of Blackwater attend this meeting, they ask us how your people should protect our troops. We replied, 
your mission according to Geneva Convention, you protect my people, not we protect you. He was angry and he uh, finished the meeting directly. When we go out, we found this clientes of Blackwater. There was also this uh, like Iraqi people, civilian with Arabian uh, scarf or uh, kufiya. They're using also very modern civilian cars. One of them was BMW or BMW. When they kill it, we have meeting with American uh, commander. But in the meeting, before we go to the meeting in the morning, we found in this day, 4 April 2004, we found all the gate to go inside or out for Lujet losses. After they know we have meeting with the commander of Marines, they allow for us to go. And we found the commander of Marines prepare for us a uh, paper with some order to Fallujah people. Two, according to the Geneva Convention, they should do one, two, three, four, and one of them don't go out, don't uh, do anything, even if they take a white flag to go to speak with uh, the American soldier. And in the end, he said, tell your people, if there is some, if they see our soldier with abnormal clothes, with something not normal, what they see our uh, soldier, they don't uh, be afraid because we have some special mission we would do against terrorists. We told him, you, you have ability to go inside. You arrested who you want. You do what you want. Why you want to punish all the, uh, the city? There is no any reason. He replay this order from Pentagon exactly, and I don't have any permission to discuss it. We return to try to help our people to do what we can do. We found the first thing, they close the two bridge to go to the hospital, which means prevent the 300,000 inside Fallujah to use any medical help. We try to create inside or to establish some medical center from any help from the uh, civilian. We found during the first days that the shooting start to be from the specialist snipers on the any body movement. Any civilian, big one, old one, uh, kids, women, therefore start to arrive for our uh, medical center, which was beside my place. Many civilians, especially from women and children, without any reason, they won't only escape from some uh, ways to go out Fallujah and the sniper shooting on them. Another type of weapons used also in this uh, battle, the cluster bomb, which arrived in the next days, more than 21 used in each day in this small town. If you see the last one on the left, uh, picture for the one from the American, uh, this very uh, famous uh, uh, crime in the media. When the, uh, the driver for this military gang asked his control uh, gun, to, uh, there is civilian with a flag they want to go or to move. What I should do, they tell him, crush them. This movie on the YouTube, and anyone can show, show this or uh, to, to confirm from our information. And if this movie remove it we have the original also during this battle we cannot arrive to the uh, cemetery of Fallujah out to take all the bodies of the died people or kill it what we should do we uh, transform the stadium of football to be our cemetery as we see in the picture in the center <coughs> if we look for all the time what we uh, confirm it and we write for the united nations all this confirming there was violation of crimes against the international humanitarian law or against Geneva conventions or the international uh, human rights law. But where is the justice? Before we go for the second battle in November 2003, I want to say one thing. My people, they know that the peace uh, protocol uh, agreed with America after the first battle was not uh, real because there is not any international guarantees to protect us because American each day they change the strategy and was all this crime or this protocol only to take more time and to prepare themselves to return to crush Fallujah or to destroy Fallujah after it start to be Najaf city also similar Fallujah as signed for resistance or independent from occupation when from the reason also was the big unity between Shia, Shia, Shia and Sunnah especially between Fallujah and the southern city Therefore, my people, when they start to uh, expose this uh, strategy or the new crime, uh, massacres against Fallujah, they go to speak with dialogue uh, peaceful with Iraqi government uh, was with, uh, uh, with Dr. Ayad Alawi. And this time, was the representative for the government of Ayad Alawi, the uh, former defense minister, Hazim Shailan. 
they arrived in the end for the peaceful protocol. The uh, former the Iraqi defense ministry asking three days before signing this protocol to uh, have more discussion inside the, the Iraqi Prime Ministry Council before they signed the, this protocol. After two days, he called the Fallujah delegation to tell them, America refused this protocol, and we don't have any ability to protect you. Go to do something for you. We arranged another meeting between the Fallujah delegation and the special uh, representative of the uh, United Nations in Iraq, Mr. Ashraf Ghazi, to tell him, look, we have a big crime coming to this our city. Try to do something. <coughs> he write a letter to Mr. Kobe Annan. Mr. Kobe Annan, all we ask, no, he write open letter to President Bush, Tony Blair, Dr. Al-Alawi. Or they refuse this uh, 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 peaceful uh, letter, and they don't allow for United Nations to go to do something or to be mediator for dialogue or to be guarantees for any uh, <coughs> agreement will be, as well as they, uh, uh, former Prime Minister uh, of uh, British, Tony Blair, he lying when he go to the parliament, British parliament, to tell him, these people refuse the peace, and we should take the weapons from them by force. And therefore, he take the permission to remove 5,000 soldiers from Basra, around Baghdad, from the side of Fallujah, to participate in this massacre. Now, what happened in this battle in November 2004? We have many evidence about, firstly, the white first war, especially the admission of, uh, ad admitted for the speaker man of Pentagon in 2006 with the BBC channel, when he said, we use this against insurgent, not against the uh, civilian and all of us, we know this type of weapons don't uh, do any distinguish between any uh, humanitarian uh, life. The second thing, we have testimonies for many soldiers, especially they show in the uh, Italian uh, program uh, for Rai News 24. If we look for many of them, how many people died, how many people affected in the first one or in this second one, there is no real estimation or there is no any ability to do real accountable. 150 killed, only the bodies killed uh, was the, in the American uh, side. They take it and they keep it in the freezer uh, to uh, protect or to keep the potato beside Fallujah. The uh, humanitarian aid, they collect 700 uh, killed person in six quarter from 28, one inside Fallujah. If we look for the real, uh, how many, 300,000 internally displaced person, what was the result for this? 226,000 uh, 20, destroyed partially, 3,000 destroyed completely, 70 masjid or mosque, 50 school, food destroyed for the whole system, 50% destroyed of the water uh, uh, for humanitarian use. 70% destroyed for the civil or sewage system. This is from the Iraq government uh, uh, reporters. One from the soldier, sorry, before we came, American uh, Marines, we have the, the testimonies of him as recorded and also as the writing. He confirmed that they use inside this many, many strategies, not only to uh, research the fighters, but also <coughs> to prevent any, uh, losing any soldier like reconnaissance by fire, which is open the fire on anything before you go inside, even there is civilian, not civilian, open the fire until to, to, to don't hire any, any sound, anything inside, and after you can go. Another strategy using bulldozer to clean the houses, and he also uh, admit about there is one case in front of him when they used this bulldozer to destroy some houses, and there was two fighter with one children and they don't do anything to save the children before they do this crime. Now we came for the, well, as Mr. Basby said, in 2006, in 2007, my organization started with Fallujah Hospital to uh, collect more evidence or more uh, data about the situation of health after we start to hear many stories about this problem. We succeeded from the, this uh, data coming from the Fallujah Hospital, signed by three doctor, official report, which we sent to WHO, and they don't reply until now, and there is many bodies inside the United Nations, not don't care, but there is a, a political control of <coughs> them to look or to investigate. We found, for example, in 2006, there is near 6,000 unknown dangerous cases, 70 versus was cancer, abnormalities between one day until 11 years 
12 years old. For the half year of 2007, there was more than near to 2,500 uh, 2, unknown dangerous cases, 70, uh, 50 percentage between children. Most of this uh, abnormalities was congenital spiral uh, cord abnormalities, congenital uh, renal abnormalities, undiagnosed cases, brain tumor. Uh, many of them, as the, uh, Mr. Basby said, we was don't know what we, what which type of the violation or which type of the situation. Therefore, after I'm very happy after the uh, Mr. Basby uh, report try to clear for us some of this. I want to finish my uh, speak about one thing. We want only the justice for my people. We need only all the people, not only Fallujah or Iraq, but also American before us to know the truth, because they have also the same problem, not only in Fallujah, this effect. And thank you very much for all. Thank you very, very much, Mohammed. Uh, we have a very short amount of time. We can stay here because a, another organization, Liberation, has this room uh, at 1 o'clock. They are going to be talking about, I believe, um, uh, communities under distress. Uh, I would, I had wanted to see if, if uh, Dita Retuma, who's from the Insti International Foundation for Research on, on Radiation Risks, could make a few comments. Uh, it'll have to be extremely brief because we have two minutes. Yeah. Do I put this on? Yeah. yeah. Hi. You push, you push a button there. The red right. button. There. Okay. On. okay. Hello. I do give my deepest condolences to the people who have suffered so much. And <clears throat> we have to realize that this affects everybody of us. Because um, these uranium particles, nanoparticles, <coughs> They do go around the world with air flows, they rain down, and time is very short to change the culture of secu security in the world. And the good point to start to change it is here in the United Nations. And uh, <coughs> we have, I personally come from Latvia and Sweden, we are also nations under enormous di economical distress and uh, so there are many levels of stress in the world that we can solve if we restructure the culture, the security culture and we need this process started today. So I would really uh, like to ask you people to approach me how we can structure this up, the nations, so that Latvian and Swedish nations can work with Iraqis and Israelis who are getting infertile. It's a question of years when the whole Israel is infertile. Wake up! This is United Nations. We have to act. And we are creating a, a new structure that will be the structure of the system of the world has to change. So from the pyramidal to the sun system structure, where one of the rays is love. And if you don't love our nations, you cannot have impact on them. You can't have agreements on our nations. So <coughs> where is the heart of United Nations? Where is it? Where can I meet it? Where can I look in its eyes? Do you know it? Anybody? Okay, this is the same answer. Nobody knows where is the heart of United Nations. I will be the heart then. And please approach me and we will create a new culture of security. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm afraid we have to uh, close. The other group is outside the door and as a courtesy to fellow NGOs, uh, we have shortened their time. Thank you very much for your attendance. We hope to have additional conferences like this in upcoming Human Rights Councils. Thank you.